The, uh, the lecture today is not going to focus on this. This is just a reminder of the things that we talked about on the first day. Um, today, when we get into visual encodings, we're actually going to talk about what I say are the words of visualization. So you can imagine a complete chart is something like a paragraph, like an essay. Visual encodings, things like color, shape, position, are these words that we're going to compose together. Um, so we're going to be talking about the words today. Always process, process, process. And then a little bit of what's the exploratory phase and what's the explanatory phase of this process. Um, let's say here, form. So the act numbers got all mixed up. I uh, have to update those. But we're talking about. Um, the form of visualizations as opposed to, um, I guess, the function, the narrative of them. And um, so this, again, is uh, IPO's Facebook. We talked a little bit about this. Um, and today I wanted to talk about some of the specifics of um, what makes up this visualization. and how we can think about this in a more, more structured manner. Um, does, anyone, does everyone remember this one? Raise your hand if you don't remember seeing this. Raise your hand if you do remember seeing this. All right. Maybe I totally didn't show it. Uh, all right, either way, um, we'll go over it again. I, I guess I was, I was convinced in my dreams that I lectured on this, but I must be <laughs> teaching another class right now, apparently. Um, so um, here, uh, Facebook offering, we didn't see it in this class. All right, cool, great. <laughs> um, so this is going to be a fairly simple chart that has not simple things going on in it. Um, and for people who have seen this before, uh, as we always like to start these things, what's the one sentence thesis that someone might come up for um, about this chart? If you can't see the x-axis is years, the y-axis is company value in billions of dollars, the chart is titled the Facebook offering, how it compares, and each one of these bubbles corresponds to a given company. This one up here is Google. Um, so one sentence thesis. What is this chart trying to tell us? <laughs> Have they? There's all of these down here, though, these tiny, tiny valuations. What was that? As an outlier valuation. Yes, there is kind of this weird exponential thing. Um, uh, well, um, just to be sure, uh, just to check the, the y axis is how much it IPO'd at, but the size of the circle is how much it's grown since then? No, so it's actually both the same. The radius of the circle communicates the same information as the y axis here. All right, uh, this is actually a five-part visualization. So I'll play it just uh, onto the scene comes Facebook. It's this very large bubble. We keep clicking. So this is actually um, changing the scale of the Y. So now instead of absolute, it's logarithmic scale. And you see the bubbles kind of raise. It kind of evens out these outliers. So this thing, it says first day pop. So these are the values of when they closed on the first day. So the difference between um, three and four is the price that they currently are at versus the price that they closed on the first day. So some of them actually closed higher than they are worth today, kind of evening out of the markets. And then five... Um, shows the price three years after. Um, new theses. This quite 
you can see the like falls in the market like 2007 present day and the trading areas as well. Mm -hmm. So right, oh, right around here-ish. Um, But if you're if you're trying to read this, and there's only one thing that you could use to sum this up, you go to your friend and you're saying, "I just saw this awesome visualization on the New York Times. It's about." <laughs> Say that one more time and louder. Why do you say that? Actually, yeah, so I think this actually Facebook isn't moving. This is like yeah. right when Facebook IPO'd. I forget what year. So this came out in 2012. Yeah, so. Three years only applies to the companies like before 2009 in this. Oh. Yeah, so this came out in 2012, um, which is a little confusing, but. Uh. Uh, I the chart is showing like the unprecedented valuation at which Facebook has got an IPO compared to like any other IPO. Mm -hmm. market yeah, yeah, so that's kind of the simplest, most obvious conclusion, um, even though there's many, many things you can take out of this. The main one that they're trying to communicate is how massive Facebook IPO'd for compared to every other starting price. Uh, so that's kind of what this shows is here's every IPO and Facebook basically pushes the scale down, which is Again, showing its unprecedented growth. And then they kind of level things off and then they try to show the, uh, the trend of how the market's evolved. Um, so there's, there's kind of some more layers to this, um, but what we're gonna focus on today is pulling this apart and talking about the visual elements that communicate this. Uh, so it is, it is uh, the company's value, I believe, where is it? I think it, chart shows. Yes, in billions of today's values, uh, dollars. Um, and let's see, I think this is Yahoo. Yeah, so it's, it will be interesting to see an updated chart for 2015, um, but everything is, adjusted and normalized as best possible. <coughs> Phone? Oh no. Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's this. No, it's a different meeting. It's an old meeting. Um, yeah, so it's still, it's still working fine on here. Um, so, yeah, oh, this is a lot, a lot on my computer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it seems to be recording fine. Um, but going back to this here, um, so we all agree in this thesis, Facebook is at this unprecedented IPO value. Um, but now I want to pull apart this out. pull apart some of the visual elements that help um, communicate this. Is this secret? It is. Um, so a little bit of backstory on this. The author is D3. Um, so the creator of this is actually the creator of Backbone.js, if people have heard of Backbone.js. And he works at um, the New York Times. 
maybe stale, maybe not. Um, but the creator of D3 used to work at the New York Times for the last like five-ish years. He recently, as of like six months ago, has left to work on D3 full-time. Um, but you'll notice a lot of the early D3 examples all come from the New York Times, mainly because they amassed this like brain trust of D3 um, developers. The project itself actually came out of Stanford um, as Mike Bostock, the creator of D3's uh, PhD thesis dissertation. Um, we'll talk more about a little of that history on Thursday of why D3 is kind of taken the visualization world by storm. Um, but since the New York Times was pushing a lot of D3 for its data journalism, other sources, um, Bloomberg has one of my favorite like visualization outlets. Um, the Guardian actually pushes a lot of great visualization, but pretty much every other news organization, 538, has adopted D3 as the like de facto standard. So if you do want to get into data journalism, D3 is the way to go, especially for the like analytical folks. Um, other questions on this? All right, let's get to the uh, the tangible things. So, what knowing that um, you can kind of intuit what visual encodings might be before I give a formal definition, um, what are some of the visual encodings in this that communicate the underlying data? So, visual encodings are just going to help us go from data to um, some visual representation. So radius. Uh, other ones. Color. Axes, I'll say position. Shape. Animation. Did we hit all of them? Text. Yeah, so I guess we're at, we'll actually talk about this as two distinct things, but for the purpose of this, scale and axes will all go in position, so just where are the circles drawn. Um, I think there might be one more. It's kind of a fake visual encoding, but one nonetheless. Uh, no, actually, yeah, so this one's kind of hard to see. It's the opacity of the circles. So you can start to see the overlap more of um, there's a high density in this bar here. So this is the like dot com first bubble. There's this like really dark purple stripe, um, which corresponds to all these companies IPOing all at once. And then I imagine they're all the ones that are going to go away in three years. Uh, oh, not so much. They kind of, they kind of lasted. Um, but there's this big gap here after this initial bubble. People didn't IPO anymore. Um, All right, so that was the easy part. Now for the harder part. Um, each of these maps to a given value of the data. Um, so radius, what does the radius correspond to? Um, value. Company valuation. 
How about color? Uh, we'll just say year or time uh, opacity. So I guess I'll say it actually doesn't really encode anything. It's this like aggregate effect, which we'll talk about after, um, what we call those position. So what's the x position? And the y? Shape? We'll say none. Animation. And then text. I would argue text is the most important visual encoding here. What does text tell us? What is the actual company? All right, so something that seems pretty small and innocuous of a scatter plot actually has seven ish encodings that all encode all these things. Some of them are the same, some of them are different. Um, things that people noticed. So, why, why do we have radius and position both representing value, or what effect does that have? I guess, so what if all of the circles are just the same radius? Yeah, so one thing that um, relates to that, uh, you can compare circles without having them necessarily um, correspond on the y-axis. And this becomes really important when we do this one to two or two to three transition. Um, so right now it's encoding the same thing, but notice as we change to a logarithmic scale, the radius of the circles doesn't change. So that's a way for us to visually associate what we knew from one and two and could compare with the valuation all the way through. So the radius stays constant and is going to give us this absolute metric to compare valuations. The y scale changes from absolute to logarithmic. So as these circles are going up and down, we can still see the absolute value encoded in the radius. Um, and this is called double encoding. So double encoding can sometimes be used for these types of very, um, I would say, layered visualization. So there's multiple things that are being communicated. Um, but it also can serve as emphasis. Um, so also up here, color and position are both year. Um, so what? effect does the color actually give us here? Does it help communicate anything? Yeah, so this, this is the one that I stale every time I present this, which is apparently a lot. Um, I haven't really figured out if it was intentional, if it's just this repetitive slightly beautiful thing. Um, some people say that it corresponds to like decade. Um, we can see like pre.com boom and post.com boom, all these things. Honestly, I think it's just a continuous color gradient from red to purple, and it just happens to overlap with those things. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe it is something that um, has some intention behind it. I haven't talked to these. Uh, data artists, so I, I don't know for sure. Um, but that's kind of the, the lay of the land of these. Um, with these. Um,
Yeah, so the, the thing with um, double encodings is you don't necessarily learn many new things about the value it's encoding, but um, I always like to think, what if they weren't there? Like if they all were gray, um, it will be really hard to differentiate between the circles, um, especially since there's overlap and there's um, yeah things very close together. So that color also helps us differentiate between things a little bit more. Uh. <laughs> any other comments? People um, have any strong positive or negative reactions? Do we think this is an effective visualization? Do we think it could be done? Yep, about 60% of companies with offerings have negative returns so far. Yeah, so I don't like how you have to go from one, um, from number four to number five to see that. You know, to me that's interesting, and maybe it's one of the more important takeaways, yet it's not obvious from looking at the static image. So I think it, if you wanted to emphasize that, which I think is worth emphasizing, then you should change, change the graphic. Uh, I guess what would you do to to make that a little bit more um, upfront. Color. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you could use color, like like red would be a, a loss in um, value and blue or green would be good in that I'm not sure. Any other ideas? Yeah. Horizontal line. Mm -hmm. So adding in more contextual data, adding how the market's doing. Um, so I'll, I'll show, uh, no. my computer says hi to me. Um, so I just wanted to show one chart. We'll talk more about this later. Uh, it's one of my favorite, I would say, like slightly esoteric visualizations. Um, it's this thing called a comet chart. Um, and what it basically shows you is statically change. So with the Facebook one, we have to click to actually see how that animates. With this one, we basically have two visualizations that are scatter plots. And the difference between those, we encode as this arrow or this line. Um, so if we did encode each one of these companies not as a circle, but as one of these arrows, um, we could see the direction of, are they all going up or are they all going down? And the way to read this is um, the smaller, the, the point is where it started, I believe. And then the flare of the triangle is the second value. Um, so you can see these are kind of spiraling down, which means that all of these that are pointing and, and kind of spiraling down have decreased in value from time step one to time step two. Um, so if we did this for the companies, we would see a similar type of um, layout where 60% of the arrows would be pointing down. Um, so that's a cool chart I just wanted to mention since it was kind of relevant. Um, Kind of. Um, in theory, you can encode multiple time steps and just like have it flare in and out. Um, but this is really most suited. It was actually developed to um, pick out what's called mixed effects, which are things that are hidden by aggregate um, statistics. So you can imagine like the mean of all of these might be increasing, even though all of them individually are decreasing. Um, you can get these weird like paradoxical results and this is a way to 
pull those out because you can see how many of these are actually pointing in, in which direction. Uh, but yeah, well, we'll talk more about that next week when we get to chart types um, and how to, how to represent some of these more complex representations. Um, and so this is a, a quote by what some people call the like godfather of modern visualization theory, um, Edward Tufte. And he's written a lot of pretty famous books around graphical display and layout, um, which is pretty much exactly visual encodings here. And what Tufte says is that um, graphics try to visually display, so data to visual, this abstract numeric quantity through the use of points, lines, coordinates, numbers, symbols, shading, color, and, and so forth. Um, so it's a way for us to interpret these very complex things much more simply, much more quickly. Um, so here's the, the chart of most of the common visual encodings. We touched on most all of these. The ones we didn't necessarily talk about here are um, enclosure, rotation, lines, since this was a scatter plot, um, and kind of displacement. Um, but there's a list of these common visual encodings. Some things are more interpretable than others. Um, if you only had one visual encoding to use to represent a value, which would you show? So if you are making a scatter plot, um, let's say x and y position and circles are what make up a scatter plot, but you have to choose one more of these. Which one would you choose to communicate a third dimension of your data? So dimension one is x, dimension two is y. Which would be your go-to for a third dimension? Yeah, so color um, for me too is probably one of the more interpretable, um, but it does run into these issues with um, being able to distinguish between minute changes. So if you have like a color gradient, it's hard to differentiate that slight subtlety. Um, but if you have things like hue, like red, yellow, blue, green, those are very easy to, to differentiate between. Mm -hmm. So discrete or continuous, um, I guess that's as, as good a time as any to actually talk about that. Uh, so this thing that we all kind of implicitly know or, or take for granted, uh, let me bring... Uh, So this thing we implicitly take for granted, such as um, what's the type of that data, um, sometimes may not be, be super clear. Um, so going back to this, um, we have valuation, year, company. Um, that's pretty much it. What, I guess, type of data and types of data or data types are things like um, continuous, Uh, categorical, ordered, uh, yeah, I guess let's say those three. So what type of data is the valuation? Continuous, categorical, or ordered? And the date. I guess we'll. Yeah, we'll. Are we'll you doing discrete? Time. Discrete? Well, I was going to say, but usually some people use it as discrete to categorize. 
price categorical and ordinal? Oh, yeah, so... Instead of using those three, though, you'll use continuous and discrete to label and label underneath discrete. Mm -hmm. So, um, these two are usually just bunched up into discrete, um, but when we're doing visualizations, there's... Oh. ...key to that difference, um, but... Going to year, we had time. How about valuation? Is valuation um, continuous, categorical, ordered, or time? Continuous. Um, and with these, let's, uh, let's try to map some good visual encodings. So if we did have to map continuous to, let's say, two or three visual encodings. You have a continuous variable. You have something like price. I'll also say that time is continuous. So um, we can have discrete time like years. But in this case, we'll say it's continuous. What of those visual encodings that we talked about can be used to visualize continuous data? So line. Color, and what do we have to do with color to make it continuous? So gradients. And uh, what was that? Size. And with line, I'll say this is also just like position. And with these discrete values, um, what actually, yeah, these are both kind of kind of the same. So what are we going to use to encode discrete uh, variables here? Shape. Color. So, what do we uh, what do we do with color different from gradient? Yeah. So, I'll say hue, um, and then one more that we can use to encode discrete or, or um, categorical. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine um, texture could be like a pattern you apply. Uh, and I guess time, I would say, is just continuous. Um, but what's unique about time that makes it different than other continuous things like valuation um, price. How is time different in this visualization from something like the valuation? Mm -hmm. So time is unique in that it is um, a continuous and ordinal uh, And given that it's continuous and ordinal, does it mean that we can use either an ordinal representation or a continuous? There's some things that can encode ordinal and categorical. There's some things that can encode continuous. There's some overlap between these. There's some that are unique to continuous. There's some that are unique to categorical and ordered. Um, so with time, we kind of have this, this constraint that it needs to both be continuous and ordinal, the intersection of, of these two encodings. And because of that, um, usually it's just on the position, the, the x-axis. Uh, 
Has anyone seen time encoded not on some axis? Can you think of any visualization that uses time in not just like a line chart x-axis fashion? Mm -hmm. I guess other Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the Facebook flowers, that actually was the animation um, as it evolved. Um, so time usually is encoded just as the x-axis or the y-axis, or it's implicitly encoded in, in the animation. Um, so this is kind of the semi-exhaustive list of all types of way to... Um, encode these things and something that I'm sure hopefully some of you have picked up is that some of these are better than the others um, so some things like X and Y position are better at communicating to you differences in value um, if I had to tell you is let's see uh, where's my mouse at is whatever this company is, and Vivo, and Vivo, I don't know what happened to this. Uh. All right, so if I asked you, is Bright Cove where is it? Is Bright Cove, this circle here, more or less than Tower Semiconductor? Or A plus communications? Going just on the size of the circle. If you didn't have any of the Y, um, would you rather have the y-axis or the radius? I guess that's a different way of saying it. Y-axis. Y um, so y-axis is much easier for us to interpret. What if I told you you could have a logarithmic y-axis or radius? Would you choose a logarithmic y-axis or the radius? What if I asked you, pick the company that is valued for $500 million, so 0.5 billion. We draw a vlogger in like Y or radius. All right, I guess what I'm getting at, um, even some things like, like y-axis, if you have a specific question, may not be the best. Um, so exponential growth is, for whatever reason, nearly impossible for us to interpret and make sense of as a human. This is why Moore's Law seems so surprising. Um, this doubling every one and a half years is surprising because we don't really get exposed to a lot of exponential processes in our lives. Um, so things like logarithmic scales can potentially be hard to make sense of if we have questions like pick a company that has 0.7 billion dollar valuation. Um, but moral of this story, some are better than others. Um, if you search for like visual encoding rankings, you get a whole slew of lists of uh, it depends on who you ask um, <laughs> so some people actually I would say most people think in terms of radius um, I mean area and why might it be a potentially bad thing that most people think of 
area instead of radius. Mm -hmm. The radius explicitly is actually coding the square of the valuation because when you look at two circles, you say that one is twice as big as the other one, but really the valuation is just encoded as the radius. So you have to do this like post processing in, in your head. It's roughly the square, not <laughs> exactly. Um, but if you search for visual encoding rankings, uh, maybe I'll send like a graphic out. Usually there's all these papers that come up from people actually doing like psychological studies. Um, I could give you my ranking and say, here is what I think as my preferred list of which ones are better than others. Um, scientists have actually gone through and done these experiments where they would show someone two different colors and say which colors more. They would show people two different circles on a y-axis and say which one's more. And they do this enough times with enough people. You can look and see, oh, most people are better at differentiating between two points with y or x position rather than color. Um, so know that there, there are these differences. Um, and usually, since you are a person and people look at your visualization, you have a pretty good sense of which ones to choose just by nature of you also having to interpret the visualization. 